Hello, and welcome to section 1.4, our introduction to limits. We are looking at making this transition from algebra topics into calculus topics, and limits provide this foundation that we'll be able to use to define a lot of our calculus materials. So we're going to start off talking about what it means for something to be a limit. We're going to look at how to understand a limit more visually, um, algebraically, how do we work with limits, uh, and then look at some special cases from there. So the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l, uh, defined using this notation right here. So in other words, what this is saying is as x is getting closer and closer to the value of a, the function, the output, or the y value, is getting closer and closer to l. So if we were trying to visualize this, so let's say we have you know, some, some function f of x right here. And we have our value a right here. Then as the x value gets closer and closer to a, so we're moving along the function here, our values are getting closer and closer to a. The function, the output values, are getting closer. Oops. The output values are getting closer and closer to L, where L is the value of the limit. So our function is getting closer and closer to L. So we define limits in this way um, so that we're kind of narrowing in on this value, whatever it may be in here. So again, as x is kind of narrowing in closer and closer, closer and closer on this point, the output values, the y values, are also narrowing in closer and closer until they all get so close that eventually we identify where the function is going as x approaches a. That value l is the limit. And we, like I was just talking about, uh, we can get as close as we like to l with f of x by taking x sufficiently close to a. So x is going to get closer and closer and closer and closer to a. And the function values are going to get closer and closer and closer to l. Now, one thing to take note of with when it comes to limits, the limit only cares about values near a, not at a. So you could have a graph where the value, say, is like right here, and there's a hole in the graph at this value. That could still be a. The limit would still be there even though there is no physical point there because we're getting really, really close to it but never actually touching the point in question. So we would still be getting closer and closer and closer to that value, whatever it is, um, without ever actually getting to the value itself. Um, so the point does not have to actually be there in order for this to work. You can take limits based off of the values near A, not at A. Now, in order for this limit to exist, so you'll notice back up here, I drew the x values coming from both sides of a. They have to match. So you can't have one side going off this way and then the other side going off that way because then there's not going to be one single value of l that we can identify as the limit. So we say that the limit exists if and only if the limits from the left and from the right both exist and are equal. The notation we use for this, for the left-hand limit is a, it looks like it's raised to 
a power of a negative. Um, that's just a symbol. It's just a notation. Um, so it just means that we're approaching uh, A from the left. And then when we approach A from the right, we do A looks like it's raised to a plus. Um, but these left hand and right hand limits will tell us if the limit itself actually exists. So let's take a look at an example. Find the limit as x approaches 2 of this given function. So notice, um, if we were able to actually just substitute in 2 here, um, that would work out really well for us. Um, that would give us a hint of where to begin. The problem is, if we were to actually do that, we would get... Uh, 12 minus 4 minus 8, so that's 0 over 0, which is an undefined value. So that actually gives us no information. So this point does not actually exist. So the value f of 2 does not exist, so dne does not exist. So we can't rely on that for information. Um, what we can do is look at values, again, that are near the value of 2, but not exactly equal to it. So we're going to take a look at values from the left and from the right. So on the left-hand side, if we start with 1, we would get, using this function, f of 1 would be as 3 times 1 minus 2 times 1 minus 8 over 1 minus 2. That would be negative 7 over negative 1, which is 7. And then I'm not going to do all the tedious calculations for all of these, but you just do that same calculation, plug in all these different numbers. Um, obviously, these get more a little more you know complex to calculate, but we can utilize a calculator, things like that. Um, for 1.5, we get an output of 8.5. 1.7 gives us 9.1, 1.9 gives us 9.7, 1.99 gives us 9.97, 1.999 gives us 9.997, 1.9999 gives us 9.9997, nine 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 and 1.99999 nine gives us 9.99997. <laughs> so it seems like we've kind of hit um, hit kind of an upper echelon here um, where we're not really able to go past a certain point here. Um, it certainly seems like these numbers are all heading towards something. Um, but let's look at it from the right as well. Um, if we were to take 3 and then substitute that value into the function, um, we would get out 13, right? and we're coming from the different side this time, so all the values are up a little bit higher. Uh, 2.5 gives us 11.5, 2.3 gives us 10.9, 2.1 gives us 10.3, 2.01 gives us 10.03, 2.001 gives us 10.003, 2.0001 gives us 10.0003, and 2.0001 gives us 10.0003. So it certainly seems like these values are approaching something, right? Some of these values coming from beneath it, some of the values coming from above it, but it does look like the function is approaching 10. So even though the function doesn't exist at 2, it appears that the function is approaching 10. And we're going to look again at this one um, a little bit later and try to verify um, what, we're, what we suspect at this point. When it comes to working with limits algebraically, we have a lot of different properties that we're able to use. Um, these properties are to our benefit. They allow us to do a lot of things mathematically that we would like to be able to do with limits. So let's go ahead and take a look at this list. So we've got C is a constant, 
And we're assuming that these limits of f and g exist, otherwise we couldn't do any of this. The limit of f plus g equals limit of f plus limit of g. So you can split up limits across addition. Similarly, limit of f minus g is limit of f minus limit of g. If you have a constant inside the limit, so limit of a constant times a function, that is the same as the constant times the limit. So in other words, you can pull constants out of limits. You can pull constants out of limits. Limit of f times g is limit of f times limit of g. Limit of f over g is limit of f over limit of g, assuming that the denominator is not zero, because otherwise that's a problem. So these properties are all telling us, basically, you can perform all those regular arithmetic properties on limits. Uh, here's where we get some kind of different ones. Um, limit of f of x raised to the n power is the same thing as the limit, the whole limit, raised to the nth power, where n is a positive integer. So if you have a limit of a function raised to a power, you can actually take the limit of the function first and then raise that result to the power. Okay, so it gives us some options in how we are computing our answers, because there may be an easier way to do it, potentially, in any given situation. The limit of a constant is that constant. Okay, and if you think about what a constant function looks like, if I said, like, you know, y equals 5 is the function, this is just a horizontal line at value 5, it doesn't matter where a is, it can be anywhere along here, the output is always heading towards 5, no matter where we are on this line. Okay, so that's more kind of visually why that works that way. Limit of x as x approaches a. Well, if x is approaching a, then the limit of x is a. Okay, so limit of x is a. Now combining this property and this property, limit as x approaches n, or excuse me, limit as x approaches a of x to the n, the limit of the x is a, and then just raise it to the nth power. So x to the n is approaching a to the n. Square roots and radicals are also powers. They're fractional powers. So the limit of the nth root of x is the same thing as the nth root of a. And the general principle, again, um, with powers like number six up here, also applies to radicals. So if you have the nth root of f, um, that's the same thing as taking the nth root of the entire limit um, instead of taking the limit of the root. And this is where n is a positive integer. So this can also help us. Like maybe I can't take the nth root of the function right now, but maybe if I take the limit first and I get out some numerical value, then I could take the nth root of it. So it presents you with options in terms of solution. And then we have a very useful property, which is the direct substitution property. Direct substitution works for polynomials or rational functions, assuming that a is in the domain of the function. The limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a. So this is an extension of a lot of these properties up here but applying it much more broadly to any function as long as it qualifies as a polynomial or as a rational function. But if that's the case, then we don't even have to worry too much about, um, about using like special tricks and algebraic tools and stuff like that. Basically, we just substitute in A and then we get out our value. So direct substitution is always a great option if it's possible. There will be plenty of cases where it is not possible. We have to kind of figure out how to work around that. So let's take a look at just a bunch of examples on the next page here. So find the following limits. 
So limit as x approaches 2 of 3x squared minus 5x plus 1. Uh, this function, of course, is a polynomial. It exists for all real numbers. Um, so you can apply something like direct substitution to this problem. So we can just take the 2 and just substitute it in for all the x values. So that's going to be 3 times 2 squared minus 5 times 2 plus 1. So that's 3 times 4 is 12 minus 10 plus 1, which of course is 3. Uh, for the next example, uh, we can try, this is a rational function, and if we were to try direct substitution here, um, we wouldn't have any problems. There could be an issue if this became a zero in the denominator, because that's not allowed mathematically. Um, but that's not the case here. So let's go ahead and use, again, direct substitution. So we get 4 minus 3 over negative 2 plus 5, so that's 3. So we get 1 third. Now, the reason that direct substitution works um, is because of all of those numbered limit properties. Um, all of those together combine to give us the direct substitution property. So what's really happening in examples like these um, so like for part C, for example, um, is we're using this limit property and we can we have a product here. We would actually be splitting this up. Limit as x approaches 1 of 2x minus 3 times limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus 1. And then we could apply properties to split that up even more and then use, you know, the limit property um, in order to substitute in for x. So this would give us 2 times 1 minus 3 times 1 squared plus 1. So that's 2 minus 3 is negative 1 times 2. So negative 2. So all these limit properties are working for us in our favor to try to help us solve any type of limit that we encounter. For part D, so we have the limit of this expression raised to the fifth power. We don't have to worry so much about that fifth power. We can just move the limit inside. 5x minus 3, and then raise that whole thing to the fifth. So it allows us to take the limit of this more manageable piece first and then raise that result to the fifth power. So we get 5 times 1 fifth minus 3 to the fifth. So that's 1 minus 3 to the fifth. So negative 2 to the fifth, which is... negative 32. So this function, as x approaches 1 fifth, the output of the function is approaching negative 32. And then for part e, so one like this, we've got a radical, and a cube root specifically, and a power, that's square. So we can apply the same limiting properties to this. Um, so we can move the limit inside of the radical, and we can move it inside of the square. So limit as x approaches 8 of x, and then squared, like that. So we move the limit all the way inside. 
Now, as x approaches 8, the limit, which is just x, that's approaching 8. So we get cube root of 8 squared is 64. Cube root of 64 is 4. So now, let's revisit the one that we think is 10. Now, direct substitution is a great tool to use, but it does have its limitations. Uh, if you were to try direct substitution here, just like we saw earlier, we saw that f of 2 did not exist, right? Because we got a 0 here and a 0 in the denominator. So we would need to play around with this a little bit. Um, before we could actually directly substitute. Algebraic manipulation is a very valuable tool in the solving of limits. So notice up here we have this trinomial, right? this quadratic function. Um, the first thing that I would look at is whether this could be factorable. Um, if it is, it would have to have a 3x and an x and then numbers that multiply to negative 8, and then the total needs to add to negative 2. So this would be uh, plus 4 and minus 2, I believe. So that would be 3x squared minus 6x plus 4x, so that's negative 2x, and then minus 8, that's that one. So yes that does factor appropriately. And we get an x minus 2 in the denominator still. Notice now, I have this x minus 2 object in the numerator and denominator. Those factors cancel away to 1. And what we just did by doing this cancellation here, by factoring and then reducing it, um, we've basically eliminated the whole in the graph, because the problem with the graph is that x approaching 2, at 2, there's nothing there. And that's because of this denominator being 0. But once we cancel that out, all we're left with is the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x plus 4, which is a polynomial, so we can use direct substitution. So 6 plus 4, which is, in fact, 10, which is what the table was indicating that the value should be. If you were to look at the graphs of these two, um, you would see that uh, this second one, so 3x plus 4, this would be, let's see, slope of 3, y-intercept of 4, something like this. And the original version, this one, would be exactly the same, except when x is 2. So that point 2 comma 10 does not exist on the original graph. There's a hole there. By eliminating that hole, we create this linear version of the equation. Um, so it gives us the same limit, though. And that's the idea here. It doesn't matter that there's a hole there. The limit doesn't care what happens at the point, only what's happening as we approach the point. Okay, so even though one has a hole and one doesn't, the limit is the same because they're still approaching the same value, which is 10. Cases like this, where we have um, something undefined, something where direct substitution won't work for us, uh, the reason this won't work is because we have uh, what is called an indeterminate limit or an indeterminate form of a limit. When we say indeterminate, so think of like determine 
like the word determine, and in meaning like not or cannot. Um, so indeterminate means that we cannot determine what the value of the limit is. Um, these types of limits require things like algebraic workarounds um, in order for us to solve them. So um, we have different ways of going about that, but oftentimes it's going to be things like this, like factoring and canceling, um, simplifying in ways that we need to um, in order to get the solution that we're looking for. We can also work with limits that involve infinity. So consider uh, a value n greater than 0 as x approaches infinity. So x, if we're on you know, our graph here, this is x, that's y. The x values are just going that way forever. They're heading off towards positive infinity, off in that direction. If x is approaching infinity, then x to the n power also goes to infinity, okay, assuming that n is positive. So if I have a value that's getting infinitely big and I'm raising it to a positive power, the result is also getting infinitely big. Okay, so in other words, as x gets larger, x to the n gets larger as well. If we have the kind of the inverse of this, if we have one over x to the n, so we have something in the bottom of a fraction down here, then as x approaches infinity, this denominator is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The problem is, because it's in the denominator of a fraction, the entire value of this is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is the inverse relationship that fractions have. So as the denominator gets really, really big, the whole thing gets really, really small. Um, and you can picture, you know, 1 over 10, 1 over 1,000, 1 over a million. These numbers, their denominators are getting huge, but the whole value is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And specifically, getting closer to 0. So if we have 1 over x to the n, where x is going to infinity, the limit is 0. So in other words, as x gets larger, 1 over x to the n gets smaller. Now, this second property is a very useful tool um, in helping us evaluate indeterminate limits by dividing by the numerator and denominator. So, sorry, that should just be by dividing the numerator and denominator by the dominant term in the denominator. And when we talk about the dominant term, we're talking about the term with the highest power. So we're taking the highest power in the denominator, and we can divide that through by top and bottom. We maintain that balance, maintain equality, um, so that we don't change the function, um, but we can use this to our advantage. In a case like this example, we have the limit as x approaches infinity. The numerator looks like it's growing infinitely large. The denominator is also growing infinitely large. And that's a problem. So what we can do, we can find the dominant term in the denominator, which is 8x squared. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to take the power. You can take the whole 8x squared, but really we just need the power of x to do this. So this is limit as x approaches infinity. 5x squared plus 7x minus 2, or 8x squared minus 3x plus 1. So we are going to multiply 
top and bottom by 1 over that leading power, so 1 over x squared. So this is how we divide, essentially. So these terms get multiplied in, right? They get distributed. So this gives us limit as x approaches infinity, 5x squared over x squared, plus 7x over x squared, minus 2 over x squared, all over 8x squared over x squared, minus 3x over x squared, plus 1 over x squared, a lot of cancellations to be had here. Uh, we get, whoops. We get one of these x's cancels with one of those, one with one, and then no cancellations on the last two. So we have limit as x approaches infinity of five plus 7 over x, minus 2 over x squared, all over 8, minus 3 over x, plus 1 over x squared. Now, according to this property, property 2 up here, if x is going to infinity, any fraction with a power of x, a positive power of x in the denominator should go to zero. So this tells us that this term, as x goes to infinity, whole thing goes to zero. This term, as x goes to infinity, whole thing goes to zero. This one goes to zero, and this one goes to zero. What's left is just a constant. So we really don't even need to take the limit anymore because the limit of a constant is just itself. So we're just left with five plus zero minus zero over eight minus zero plus zero. So we're just left with five eighths. So it turns out that this function as x goes to infinity, so as we just keep going further and further in the positive x direction, the function actually levels out at a value of 5 eighths. And thinking back to what you might have learned in an algebra class, um, this is what we would call a horizontal asymptote. Um, or maybe you saw that in like a pre-calculus course. Um, but this is the long run behavior of this function. So as x goes to infinity, the output, the y value goes to 5 over 8. For part B, we can apply the same technique. So if we look at the denominator, we've got that x squared. So let's go ahead and do the same thing. So we've got 1 over x squared, 1 over x squared. So we have limit as x approaches infinity of, let's see, we've got 3x's here divided by 2 of them. So we still have an 8x here plus... 7 over x minus 2 over x squared all over, that's just a 5, plus a 3 over x plus 11 over x squared. So just like the last case, um, all of these go to 0. The primary difference here is we still have a variable. The limit as x approaches infinity of 8x over 5. And there's no special kind of tricks to get us out of this one. As x goes to infinity, 8x is going to also go to infinity. The fact that you're dividing it by 5 doesn't change the fact that it's growing infinitely large. Um, so this limit actually is heading towards infinity. 
Now, technically speaking, um, saying that a limit is going to infinity is pretty much the same thing as saying the limit does not exist. Because the concept of a limit is that, you know, it should be stopping somewhere, right? Or reaching kind of a peak value where it doesn't cross that value. Um, and, you know, infinity is kind of the antithesis of that. It's the idea that it just grows infinitely forever. Um, but we like to use this as kind of our shorthand to indicate that instead of writing limit does not exist every time. Um, if we know that it's growing infinitely large, we'll use infinity or negative infinity if it's growing infinitely small. Uh, and then this part C down here. Um, so notice the leading term here, the dominant term in the denominator is another 2x squared. So we're going to go ahead and do the same thing. And I promise not every limit problem involves an x squared. Um, but I think it's just nice to see kind of the comparison of them side by side and see all the different possible outcomes that can occur. So... If we distribute in that 1 over x squared, we get 7 over x minus 3 over x squared over uh, 2 plus 5 over x squared. We have a 0, a 0, a 0. So we have limit as x approaches infinity of 0 over 2. Now, the original version of this, as x goes to infinity, that is indeterminate, right? This is something that cannot be determined. Um, however, what we have here is not indeterminate because it's not even undefined because this one goes to zero, but the denominator does not go to zero. It actually is constant at two. So this number, zero over two, is actually just zero, and the limit of a constant is itself. So it turns out that that limit is zero. So we have a few different types of outcomes here that are typical of limits involving infinity. So you can have cases where it's a little more balanced, they even out to a particular value. You can have cases where it continues to grow infinitely large, and you can have cases where um, it actually heads down towards zero and starts leveling off at zero as x goes to infinity. Uh, we will continue using limits. We will look to use them to identify more properties of uh, calculus in the coming sections and use them to uh, derive some of our major pieces of calculus that we're going to be seeing over the next several chapters. So that brings us to the end of section 1.4, and I will talk with you all next time.